students into the idea of public service. So, I'm, and I, I must tell you that from a personal point of view, it's been one of the both professional and personal highlights of my career to be, have been able to work with him. So this, is, this holds lots of special memories for us today as we do this. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our university provost, Dr. Tim Tracy, and he's going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Provo, uh, Dr. Dr. Provost, Dr. Tracy has been our provost for almost two years now, where he came to us from our top-ranked pharmacy college. He has a PhD in pharmacy from Purdue University, and now at UK as provost, he is working on increasing, enhancing the quality of our programs, both at our graduate and undergraduate levels. 
not a, not a small task. So thank you, Dr. Tracy, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Toma, and thank to all of you for coming out today for this wonderful occasion. And certainly the, the lecture we're going to receive, which I'm sure will be very invigorating, but also uh, with this current election season, quite uh, interesting as we, as we go through it. When the Martin School and the university decided last year to establish the annual Wendell H. Ford Public Policy Lecture, the goal was really twofold. The first goal was to honor the public service legacy of Senator Ford, who served our Commonwealth as a state senator, mm -hmm. lieutenant governor, governor, and U.S. Senator over a career that spanned nearly four decades. The second goal was to create a forum, like we're doing today, where our students and the university community would have the opportunity to interact with nationally recognized experts on important public policy issues of the day. No one in Washington or elsewhere is more qualified to help us meet both those goals than our honored guest and featured speaker today, former Senator Tom Daschle of South Dakota. And I'd like to take a few moments to spend, spend a few moments telling you why it's such an appropriate speaker choice this year. Senator Daschle graduated from South Dakota State University in 1969, served in the United States Air Force from 1969 to 1972, was elected as a Democrat to the 96th Congress in 1978 and re-elected to the three succeeding Congresses, encompassing January 1979 to January 1987. In, he, however, he was also elected to the United States Senate in 1986, re-elected in 1992 and 1998. He served as Senate Minority Leader from 95 to 2001, and then as Senate Majority Leader from 2001 to 2003. He also served as co-chair of the Democratic Policy Committee, the Democratic Conference from 89 to 99. Quite a distinguished record of service in government. But between 1994 and 1998, his second in command was Senator Ford, who had been first elected Democratic Whip in 1992. The two forged a deep friendship and worked closely together to help pass many pieces of important legislation during their tenure together. And their friendship continued long after Senator Ford retired in 1998. As far as public policy goes, Senator Daschle has a well-deserved reputation as someone who during his long public career understood and mastered the art of working with the opposition to find the elusive common ground necessary to resolve important public policy matters. Shortly after leaving the Senate, he, along with three other former Senate leaders, Republicans Howard Baker and Bob Dole, and Democrat George Mitchell, Mitchell co-founded the Bipartisan Policy Center. Today, it is the only Washington, D.C. think tank dedicated to finding bipartisan public policy solutions. Earlier this year, Senator Daschle, now CEO of the Daschle Group in Washington, teamed with his friend, former Senate Republican leader Trent Lott of Mississippi, to co-author a book that elevated the issue of bipartisanship and government gridlock to a new level of discussion. They called their book Crisis Point, why we must and how we can overcome our broken politics in Washington and across America. Senator Daschle is here today to tell us why he co-authored the book, what he hopes it can accomplish, and with just three weeks until the November 8th election, how he foresees the 2016 elections at the presidential, Senate, and House levels, and how that impacts the cause of bipartisanship in Washington for better or for worse. Please join me in welcoming to the University of Kentucky, the Honorable Tom Daschle. My goodness, 
Dr. Tracy, thank you for that extraordinary introduction. Dr. Tava, members of the Ford family, I'm so flattered that you're here, and I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and what a spectacular venue to be speaking in. I want to thank the Business School for giving us uh, permission to meet here today, uh, and the Martin School and the Henry Clay Center for their co-sponsorship. I listened to Dr. Tracy's, and I want to thank Merle Hackbart, too. Merle, as you, some of you may know, is a South Dakotan. And uh, we went to South Dakota State University at just about the same time. He'll be going back there for our biggest day of the year, Hobo Day, this, this, uh, this Saturday. I, uh, and he can tell you more about Hobo Day, I'm sure. He was, he was actually Hobo Day chairman one year. So that's how big a guy this really is. He's, but I, I listened to Dr. Tracy's introduction, and one of my favorite introduction stories occurred a few years ago. I was introduced in much a similar fashion, very effusive, and I'm so grateful for his kind words. But the person introducing me used the word model. He said, Dashiell's a model politician and a model South Dakotan and a model senator. And I felt great about that, but my wife was in the audience, and later on that night she showed me the word model as it's defined in the dictionary. And there it's defined as a small replica of the real thing. <laughs> so I listened carefully, and Dr. Tracy didn't use that, and I appreciate it. The other thing that happens to you, and I'm sure some of you can identify with this, going through the airports these days is always an interesting experience. A couple of months ago, I was going through one of the airports, and I was in a hurry because I was a little bit late, and I was rushing to my plane, and I needed to get there as quickly as I could. I quickly took my jacket and shoes off, and as I was going through the metal detector, the guy in the back right behind me said, I just got to ask you, anybody tell me you look like, look like that guy Tom Daschle? <laughs> I said, because I was in a hurry, I didn't want to get into a long discussion. I said, yeah, people have said that. <laughs> he said, doesn't that make you mad? <laughs> Well, I hope I can get through the hour without making anybody too mad. I was elected, Dr. Tracy noted that I was elected for the first time in 1978. And what he didn't say is uh, that I was elected, believe it or not, by 14 votes in 1978, which in South Dakota is 60 percent. But <laughs> it took me a year and 21 days to be declared the winner. I was seated conditionally. And uh, I remember those days very, very fondly because I finally got through it all. But I sought out people that I had admired greatly. And one of those people I sought out at the time was a man who you may, whose name you may recognize, Claude Pepper. Claude Pepper was a, con was a senator, was defeated, and then went back to the House and had a very distinguished career as a House member. He was chairman of the Rules Committee. I walked into his office, and I swear it looked like a room this size. And I asked him one day if he could just give me advice. I didn't know if I, literally at that time, I didn't know if I was going to be there for a week or a month. Uh, we were going through the ballot counting again for uh, a third or fourth time. It went all the way to the state Supreme Court. And as he sat there, he said to me, he says, you know, let me give the best advice I think I've got, which is, you're a Democrat and I'm a Democrat, but it sure doesn't make much difference whether you're an R or a D, as much as it matters whether you're a C or a D. He said, by that I mean, it doesn't matter as much whether you're Republican or Democratic as whether you're a constructive or a destructive in the political and legislative process. He said, I hope you're going to be a C. I swear I never forgot that admonition. And when I got to meet Wendell Ford, I met a C in capital letters with an exclamation point. Wendell Ford taught me a lot about what it was like to be a great senator, about what it was like to reach across the aisle, about what it was like to have a good sense of humor, about what it was like really to be in a room and cut a deal. And he loved cutting deals. And I don't know if there's anybody better. I don't know if there's anybody more popular than Wendell Ford. And so when I had the opportunity to become leader, and by the way, I only won by one vote. 
And Wendell came in the next day. He voted for a good friend of his, Chris Dodd. He came into me the next day, into my office, and he said, you know, I wasn't with you, but I'm on your team now. And he became my most loyal, my most incredibly invaluable member of my leadership team. And we got to be <coughs> so close. I love that man. And I can see why you honor him with this lecture series. And for that, I'm very grateful. We're going through a very historic and transformational time. The world is being redivided into regions of order and regions of disorder. 48,000 people every single day are flocking from the regions of disorder into the regions of order. In Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Germany, in Greece, even here. There are more failed states today than there has been at any other time since World War II. And it has profound consequences on the rest of us. Profound. The real question is, why? Why is it happening now? I don't think anyone can give you a definitive answer, but I would propose, suggest four factors. One is Moore's Law. The fact that our technological advancement doubles in our capacity every two years. Technology has changed the way we work, the way we live, the way we communicate, the way we govern. Every aspect of our lives is affected by technology, for good and ill. The second is globalization. There has been a harmonization of our cultures and in so doing, a tension between those who want to embrace it and those who want to repel it. And that globalization plays itself out in so many different dimensions every single day. We also have extremist terror organizations like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, organizations with no geographical boundaries, increasingly dangerous, increasingly posing serious threat, not only to the region, but to the world. I attended a briefing not long ago that said, there is every likelihood that some of these organizations already have weapons of mass destruction and intend to use them. And the fourth factor is a breakdown in governance a dysfunctional state in among so many countries, especially in the developing world, but really all over the world today. An inability to deal with all this change. We weren't really prepared for this. We didn't really see it coming. In some ways, we've had it pretty good for the last 70 years. After World War II, the world community came together and embraced what we commonly refer to as Bretton Woods. The United States was going to offer world support for security and military stability. And in part because of the Cold War, we found this standoff between us and the communists. But for all this time, our trading lanes have been protected, and we've had relative security, but that's changing. Support for this international commitment that we made 80 years ago is waning. People are becoming more concerned about these commitments and who's paying for them. Those feelings are becoming more and more evident in part because of Two wars that have drained our treasury and been responsible for the loss of thousands of lives in Afghanistan and Iraq, in part because of a great recession that caused enormous upheaval economically. 
in part because of an income disparity now that's growing in this country and elsewhere, in part because there's sort of a palpable sense of decline in many parts of our country, especially in rural areas, where small towns are having a very difficult time coping. All of those factors are playing themselves out. And what has happened as a result is our country is deeply divided. Divided over the role of government in society today. We're divided about the role of our country in the world today. The Pew Research Center said you have to go back 160 years to find a time when our country was as polarized and divided as it is today. It's exacerbated in part by the dysfunction in Washington. It is an ideological debate but it's also a tactical debate. And that tactical debate plays itself out almost daily in Washington between those who believe they were sent to Washington to stand their ground. And those who believe that the only way you can function in a democratic republic is to find common ground. Those who believe that you have to stand your ground believe that Oftentimes, compromise is really capitulation. And they weren't sent to capitulate. They were sent to defend. And so the standoff goes on. And as much as I lament it, in some ways I call it the noise of democracy. Not very stereophonic. Not easy to listen to, but think of the alternatives. The noise of violence in Syria, no noise at all in countries where you're arrested just for speaking out, the noise of democracy. Imagine, if you will, a stadium large enough to hold 320 million people, and the, the president down in the center of that stadium saying, all right, today we're going to decide what is our tax policy going to be? What is our health policy going to be? Imagine the cacophony of voices. Imagine trying to figure out what it is in that kind of a setting. Well, that goes on in Congress every day. But the confrontation and the polarization has exacerbated people's attitudes about the whole process. Lyndon Johnson, as our history majors will know, was majority leader for just six years, arguably the best and most effective majority leader in our history. If I asked a class, how many filibusters do you think Lyndon Johnson faced? The answer is one in six years. It was the Civil Rights Act of 1957. But if I were to ask you, how many filibusters have we had in the last six years? The answer is 422. Why? Why is this going on? Well, we changed our filibuster rules, for, for starters. I'll come back to that in a minute. But Filibusters aren't what they used to be. You don't have to hold the floor anymore. There used to be real pain involved. You had to stand there. And if nature called, that's tough. You're going to stand there. Strom Thurmond holds the record 24 hours and 37 minutes in one speech. But far more consequential, I think, in part for simplicity's sake, I'll say the airplane. The airplane has allowed members of Congress literally to leave Washington on Thursday, come back to their states or districts, return to Washington on Tuesday, and try to squeeze in enough legislative work on Wednesday to manage 
all the responsibilities of Congress today. You can't run this country on Wednesday. In part because it's just too expensive now to have two homes. In part, there's an expectation you're going to be back in your state. And there's almost a stigma attached to anybody who spends any time too long in Washington. But the fact that we're not there anymore, the fact that we don't know each other, the fact that we don't have relationships anymore, the fact that we don't communicate, and because we don't communicate, there's not enough ability to trust. And if there's no trust, there can't be any real progress. So the airplane is one. The media has changed. My goodness, it used to be the media was the referee. Walter Cronkite would say something and the American people believed it. He called strikes and fouls. Now the media is the participant. Now they're right in the thick of things. And with social media today, truth is just an option. And so it's very hard to separate all that out. And the hyperbolic exchanges on all sides further exacerbate the ability to think reasonably and rationally. The third factor, and I could go on at some length about how many more factors there are, but the third factor, and I'll limit it to this, is money. A senator today has to raise $15,000 every single day he or she's in office to have what resources you need to make it through the next election. It's now not uncommon to spend 20, 30, 40 hours a week doing nothing but raising money, dialing for dollars, going to fundraisers. And I worry, frankly, about the increasing quid pro quo feel that there is around raising money in Washington these days. <coughs> All those factors are very serious issues that are going to have to be confronted if we're going to figure out a way to deal with improving the quality of our governance in this country today. But that is the backdrop we face for the elections of 2016. All of that is playing itself out. The American people are just very, very concerned. And so as we look at the election today, interestingly, I, I would assert that the normal context within which we look at elections, Republican versus Democratic, is only one of three contexts this year. And it may even be third in importance. Another context is insider versus outsider. It's all those people who feel disaffected, whether it's a Sanders voter or a Trump voter, on the outside, supporting the outsiders, versus those who are on the inside, recognizing the importance of maintaining some degree of continuity and governance. But that inside versus outside contrast is playing itself out every single day in this election. And the third context is what I, for lack of a better term, call open and closed. There are those who really believe that the best solution to all the challenges that we face is to focus exclusively on us and this country. So let's wall up our borders and let's forget about trade and international engagement. Let's pull back and make them pay and all of that. And all that plays itself out in that sort of closed observation about the direction our country should take. Versus those who believe, no, the real answer is we can't wall ourselves off. We have to be engaged. There has to be a recognition of this globalization. It's not going to quit just because we want to deny it's there. So open versus closed, inside versus outside, and oh yes, Republican versus Democratic. The election is also somewhat of an ethnic contrast that I found fascinating. If you look at Secretary Clinton, she has 75% of the Hispanic, African American, and Asian vote. But Donald Trump has 75% of the non-white non-college vote, or the white non-college vote. 
huge margins on either side, divided demographically for the first time. There are three weeks to go. Some would say thankfully. Three weeks. And I think there are four factors that are probably going to determine how ultimately this all plays out. The first factor, I would say, is one that we've seen plenty of in the last couple of months, and that is personal revelations. Things we didn't know about the candidate that we certainly know now. And because both candidates have historically high negatives, the typical negative for a presidential candidate, believe it or not, in modern history is about 7%. Our two candidates, prime candidates running this year, have a negative of 52 and 55%. So personal revelations have an even greater impact on those with high negatives. The second will be the, the final debate tomorrow night. Debates, when the margin is this close, can really make a difference. They can swing votes. And the first two have swung them marginally uh, on the side of Mrs. Clinton, but, but not consequentially. But that third debate tomorrow night will be a factor, especially when you consider somewhere between 60 and 80 million Americans are going to be watching. The third factor is what we commonly call the October surprise. Something comes out of the blue. It could be anything. It was Hurricane Sandy, believe it or not, in 2012. But something we just didn't anticipate. God forbid a terrorist act or anything that would affect our sense of security. Those issues in particular are very problematic. And then finally, the last factor is probably the most important of all. And that's turnout. Turnout is really critical <laughs> this year. And on the Trump side, you have a lot of energy. On the Clinton side, you don't have as much energy, but you have a great organization. So turnout will be affected by energy and organization. And it'll be interesting to see which Trump's which, if I can use that term. <laughs> that is, that is probably the single biggest unknown, in part because we've seen two examples just in the last six months with Brexit and Colombia, where the polls were totally off because they couldn't figure out turnout. Well, turnout is going to be a factor here. So today, the Electoral College, if you take where the polls are and can do as much as possible to understand what the modeling for turnout might be, According to 538 today, they had, uh, I think, Mrs. Clinton at 256, Mr. Trump at 157, with 125 electoral votes undecided. Given that, I would say she has about a 70% chance of winning, but that's just a guess. On the Senate side, 24 Republicans and 10 Democrats are defending their seats, or their open seats, and it's amazing, there are about a dozen states now where we're in the margin of error. And I don't think anybody can say today with any clarity or any confidence how that's all gonna play out. I'd put the Senate at 50-50 at in terms of the likelihood of one or the other party ultimately pulling it out. And it may even be a 50-50 Senate, which is what we had in 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2000. So the House, that this, the Senate is, is, uh, uh, is unpredictable as any we've seen in recent times. The House is a little more predictable. The House currently has 246 Republicans, 188 Democrats, 247 Republicans, 188 Democrats. Uh, there are about 24 uh, seats that are technically in play, but the Democrats need 30 in order to, uh, to win back the majority. And I would say there's only about a 30% chance that they're going to do that. I think it's highly likely that the Republicans will retain control of the House. What concerns me is that these trends we've, I've tried to describe today won't necessarily end with the election. In the past, it used to be elections 
came to a close and we started governing again, but I worry to a certain extent about the polarization that's likely to continue. And the list of legislative urgency is just in, increasingly very onerous for a lot, I think for anybody who looks at this in, a, in an open and a, in, a, in a balanced way, we've got to deal with immigration. We've got to find a way to deal with tax reform. We've got to figure out what we're going to do on health care. We've got serious questions involving our global commitments and, and where they're going to be. We've got budgetary issues that are demanding attention. And so all of that continues to, to become very, very pronounced as we try to make, make some headway with this growing and very urgent agenda. Senator Lott and I wrote the book Crisis Point about a year and a half ago. It came out just in January. Because we think that currently the state of our democratic republic is very, very fragile. We assume that it's always going to be here, but it's not. Any democratic republic is built on four pillars. Tolerance, respect for the rule of law, leadership, and participation. And all four of those pillars <coughs> are threatened today. There's a story that if you've read much about Benjamin Franklin, you may enjoy as much as I do. Benjamin Franklin, as you know, was the most senior member of our founding fathers group. And he was, because he was the most senior, the person they asked to, choose, uh, to, to speak for the for the men in the room at the end of each day of their deliberations. On the second night, as he stepped out on the steps to announce to the crowd that had gathered what had been decided for the day, a woman yelled out to Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, what will it be? A monarchy or a republic? He thought for a minute and he said, man, it'll be a republic if we can keep it. We've been charged with keeping this republic now for 220 years. And frankly, right now we're not doing as good a job as we need to. And so the whole idea behind the book Crisis Point is to say, well, if we're going to try to do a better job, what do we need to do? And what we felt was that there are three categories of things that needed to be done if we're really going to try to get our arms around the problem. The first is electoral reform. We've got to figure out how we can end the gerrymandering that goes on in states all over the country where it's predictable that a Democrat or a Republican is going to win that seat. There's only about 30 competitive districts in the country today. We've got to figure out what we're going to do about money. We've got to figure out, and here Wendell Ford was the real apostle, how can we ensure people are more enfranchised to vote, not less? Could we move our elections to Saturday? What would be wrong with that? Could we figure out new ways to engage? But we've got to figure out ways to improve the way we organize our elections today. A stunning figure that is just hard still for me to believe is that, ironically, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both had the same percentage of registered voters who actually were responsible for nominating them. Nine percent. Ninety-one percent of Democrats and Republicans registered to vote didn't vote. And we are where we are. We need electoral reform. The second category is congressional reform. We've got to fix the filibuster. We've got to do one of two things, either eliminate the filibuster practice for certain activities or go back to what it used to be. What it used to be is if, if you were going to filibuster, you had to be on the floor and you had to stay there as long as it took to make your point. 
We also didn't do something we call dual tracking. Now with a filibuster, we just set it aside and move on to something else. We stayed on that bill. We also ought to understand the importance of inclusion. Caucuses today have become pep rallies. We charge up our caucuses and they go out and we go on and take on the team. There has to be more opportunity for joint caucuses and more dialogue. The president needs to do a lot better job of bringing people to the White House, to Camp David. I would love to see, at the beginning of every year, the president calling the leaders to Camp David, working out an agenda, and making that the first announcement the president makes to the State of the Union. Here is what the leaders and I agreed we'd try to do in the first few months of this new session of Congress. I would like to see a five-day work week. I don't see how we're going to continue to govern one day a week. Out of the 365 days of the calendar year, the Senate and the House are in session a little over 100 of those days. We just got to do better than that. The third area is citizen engagement. Trent and I feel strongly that every young person ought to have a commitment to public service for a year. It can be anything. But something happens when you're in public service. It can be one of the most fulfilling experiences you could ever have. But we don't see enough of that today. Claude Pepper also shared another comment with me, a piece of advice that I've always remembered. He said, if you're going to be effective in our democratic republic and in this Congress, you better have 2020 eyesight. You better be interested and you better be engaged. Two eyes. Interested and involved, I should say. Interest and involvement is something I think that's harder and harder to do because people feel disenfranchised. And so citizen engagement, a recognition that we've got to find ways to engage our electorate more effectively is so critical as well. Archibald McLeish was our poet laureate for a number of years in the late 30s. They persuaded him to become librarian of Congress. He said, well, I'll become the librarian of Congress on the condition that I no longer have any responsibilities as poet laureate. Don't expect me to write any poems. And he lived with that circumstance during the entirety of World War II with one exception. He was asked by a good friend of his to come to Arlington National Cemetery to watch the burial of a young soldier who had been killed in Germany. He watched it and he was moved to tears. He came back to his office and in five minutes, he said, wrote our dead young soldiers. He speaks for that soldier from the grave. And the soldier says, our lives are not ours, they're yours. You will give them their meaning. Our deaths are not ours, they're yours. given their life so that we can be here today. We honor them, but we owe them. And whether or not we can pay our debt to them depends on whether we have the leadership, the engagement, and the recognition of that obligation to keep this republic strong. Martin School is doing that every day here. The Henry Clay Center is doing that every day here. And with that, I'm optimistic it will continue. And we will, we will see this democracy survive. Thank you all very much.
I'm Al Cross, the director of the Institute for Rural Journalism and Community Issues in the School of Journalism and Media, the College of Communication and Information at UK. I think I've touched all the academic bases to speak. Um, we're really pleased to have a couple of uh, outstanding uh, political folks uh, from uh, different uh, areas of the political universe to join Senator Daschle in the panel discussion. At the far, uh, my far left, your far right, is perhaps the Kentuckian most prominent in national politics who has never been elected to public office. <laughs> Mike Duncan was the 60th chairman of the Republican National Committee from 2007 to 2009. <laughs> He was known as one of the few Kentuckians who had a nickname from George W. Bush, who called him Dunk. <laughs> he raised a record amount of money for the RNC. He's worked and advised, uh, worked for and advised Republican candidates and parties at the local, state, and national level. He's been in the campaigns of five U.S. presidents and has been a delegate to nine Republican national conventions and chairman of the Rules Committee for several of those, right? He worked in the George H.W. Bush White House as Assistant Director of Public Liaison. George W. Bush appointed him to the Tennessee Valley Authority Board, which uh, he later uh, served as chairman. And he is the founding chairman of American Crossroads, a political action committee that uh, his bio says is organized to elect federal candidates dedicated to lower taxes, less government, individual responsibility, and a strong national defense. <laughs> or Republicans, right? <laughs> Uh, he's been board chairman of a state university and a private college and chairman of Governor Ernie Fletcher's transition team. He serves as president of the CEO of the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, chairman and CEO of the INS Deposit Bank, and he has degrees from Cumberland College and the UK School of Law. Mike Duncan. Next is the colleague here at UK who I consider Kentucky's premier political scientist, Dr. Steve Voss. He's a Louisiana native who began his involvement with electoral politics as a journalist. He covered the Republican National Convention in New Orleans in 1988, was a State House reporter in Baton Rouge, and he covered the political emergence of David Duke. He earned a doctorate in government from Harvard and has done a wide range of research, including congressional districting, racial politics in the South, and more recently, Kentucky politics. His commentary frequently appears in local, state, and national uh, media outlets, even international outlets. And through his work, UK was mentioned more than a thousand times in the media in 2014. He's been president of the Kentucky Political Science Association, and he's won teaching awards from both the UK Alumni Association and the UK College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Steve Voss. First question goes to Mike Duncan. Mike, in the uh, wonderful book by Senator Lott and Senator Daschle, they have uh, several pages of praise for our friend Howard Baker the senator from Tennessee who was majority leader and uh, has been called by many people the person who was most qualified to be president but never was. I know you may not necessarily agree with some of the problems or solutions uh, identified by Senator Daschle, but clearly we are at a crisis point. Uh, people have uh, uh, not enough confidence in our government. We are a very polarized country. And Congress is where we're supposed to work these things out. What sort of advice do you think the late Howard Baker would have for his successor, Mitch McConnell, and others in the leadership? Well, what a great question, Al. And uh, my hero and mentor for many years, Howard Baker, Al, and I got to spend the afternoon with him uh, a couple of years before. He tried to help me raise some money. Yeah, actually did. <laughs> uh, he, he would ask us, what did we know and when did we know it about <laughs> politics and government in this country, Senator? I think Senator Baker was one of those who understood what politics and government meant and the fact that there was a campaign and after the campaign there, there was governance to be done. And he was always there with solutions. 
But Howard Baker that I grew up knowing, his father was my congressman. I grew up on the Tennessee-Kentucky border, and Gene Seiler was my congressman on one side, and Howard Baker's father was my congressman on the other side. His father taught him the art of listening, and I think that's one of the things that you talk about in, in your book. Uh, he also taught him the art of chemistry. We used to go watch Howard Baker's father get on the train and go off to Washington and represent us, and then he would come back and he'd be there gardening uh, in, in Huntsville, Tennessee, uh, and it was very personal. Uh, he invited a lot of people. I remember seeing Everett Dirksen as a child in, in his garden. Uh, later on, Senator Baker invited uh, Ronald Reagan to go to church in the little church in Huntsville, Tennessee. Yeah, that took some doing. It did, and we had to have an <laughs> extension to our air, our airport there to be able to land the plane. <laughs> Don't know how that worked. You? I'm not sure. But th this this whole thing about uh, comity and getting along and knowing each other is absolutely true. And Senator National I, and I spent 16 hours together one time, and it was kind of like Gilligan's Island. We were on this plane going to China, and the the professor was Tom Daschle because he was working, he was engaging us, asking us all these questions all during that time. The person that owned the plane was uh, uh, was another friend of ours whose father was very active in, in independent politics uh, in the country. And we had Madeleine Albright, and it was just a, a great time. That chemistry has fallen over. When I took over the job uh, with the Coal Coalition to build extra, I called Tom Daschle, and, and, and I called Madeleine Albright, and I said, I need some Democrats to help me with this because this is bigger than just Kentucky or West Virginia or Pennsylvania. This is about national security. Tom Daschle gave me some ideas that day. So I think Howard Baker would say, get along with people, know who you're dealing with, understand the process, and separate governance from politics. You think that's about right, Senator? Is that what Senator Baker would say? I literally could not say it better. I thought Mike just really hit it out of the park. That's exactly right. We lack that chemistry right now. You know, I, I, I think that it's it's hard because you've got such an eclectic, firebrand group of people in both caucuses right now that, uh, that it's much harder for leaders to do that. But the more comity, the more governance, the, and the more the, I should say, the better the quality of governance. And uh, we need comity badly in our country today. In the book, you talk about the uh, lack of chemistry between Senator McConnell and Senator Reid. Um, Senator Reid is not going to be there. Senator Schumer is going to be the Democratic leader, and I think chances are the majority leader, but it's still push come to shove. Will there be a better relationship between Senator McConnell and Senator Schumer than there has been between McConnell and Reid? Well, they're both pragmatists, and they, uh, I, I think that the opportunity for a reset always presents an opportunity for uh, a, a better set of circumstances, so I'm hopeful. It's going to take, you know, they, they both are going to have to try to reach out. And it's going to require the new president, whoever that is, reaching out as well. But that opportunity <laughs> always exists when you've got new personalities involved. And they're both pragmatists. I, I think we can hope for better days. That leads me to my next question. And this is a question for all three of you. Uh, I'm going to start with Steve. Um, in the book, uh, the senators uh, uh, decry the lack of presidential consultation by President Obama. Uh, and Senator McConnell has actually been complimentary of the work that Hillary Clinton did as a senator. Uh, I think that for uh, better White House congressional relations uh, if Clinton is elected. Steve. Well, we were just talking about pragmatists, and uh, you know, Hillary Clinton does have more of a reputation for cutting deals. Uh, when that shows up in the media, though, the compromisers, the negotiators, the deal cutters, uh, it's passed through a very cynical filter, right? It's analyzed for what they're trying to gain. Uh, uh, it's, it's not portrayed heroically, uh, cutting of deals. You know, when you look at, at our TV shows, they don't make cutting deals heroic, right? They make fighting battles heroic. So, I, you know, I, I think that uh, what, we'll, what we'll see and uh, what I hope we'll see is not only deal cutting, but more of the celebration of the deal cutting uh, that the Lot and Dashiell book calls for uh, than we've seen in the past. I don't know how you get that, though, when social media and, and more rapid-fire press coverage is, is the way we learn about what's happening in Washington. Well, I agree with Steve. I, I, you know, transparency is an interesting thing. And I think we generally think of transparency as a good thing, and it is for the most part, but it precludes candor oftentimes. It really undermines 
the ability to say things that you really want to say but can't because there's a camera there. Uh, and I, I, I worry about that. I, I, I also think that rather than talk to each other, members, because the camera's there, would prefer oftentimes to talk to the camera. And that's not a good thing. So uh, Steve's right. It's, it's, I don't think we should be myopic about it. This isn't going to be easy. Uh, and I, I would, what I would love to see, if I could, I don't think it's even myopic, but it's, I'd love to see the president twice a month at least, I'd preferably even once a week, bring the leaders down and say, okay, even if it's the tiniest thing, what can we announce we're doing together this week? You know, maybe it's maybe it's a, a nomination, maybe it's a, an amendment on something, or, you know, just something to, just to get us going. Uh, but I think that would start to set the right tone. But we're going to have to figure out something like that. Mike, can Hillary Clinton do something like that? Well, I'm, I'm going to rephrase your question in just a moment, but I want to add a little spice to this. Sometimes you need to be the skunk at the garden party to make things a little bit different. I want to defend Senator McConnell on returning regular order. If you look at the process of filling the tree, that's the number of amendments that you can have in the Senate on a main motion that goes before you, and, and the leader gets to fill the tree first. Senator McConnell has restored main, regular order. Harry Reid didn't do that, and we've got- He was a Christmas out. tree kind of guy. He was, <laughs> and we got a transportation bill. It was a five-year bill we hadn't done. We got a balanced budget. We got a bill on opiates, you know, and on and on. So we've had a more productive Congress. People do make differences, and elections make differences. Let me go back now and challenge your immediate question. You're assuming that Hillary Clinton has won, and I think I heard Senator Daschle say he doesn't know yet whether the intensity of the Trump voters and the lack of turnout potentially on the Hillary voters will make that uh, make Well, and analyze them both. I mean, uh, Clinton's got experience in Washington, plenty of it. Trump has zero. I, I think uh, what, what's the potential of each to uh, form a better working relationship? I think both will have the motivation to do that. I think you're going to see better relationships with the White House and Congress this time than you have with Barack Obama. I've met Barack Obama. He, he's, he's a very scholarly person, uh, someone that, that you'd want to sit and talk to, but he's not the most gregarious person. He's not the one who picks up the phone and calls you and asks you to come down to the White House. I, I think the members of the Democrat caucus would tell you that. He doesn't reach out to the Republicans. He, he I know I'm in an academic area, but he approaches it more like a professor than he does a practitioner of politics. And that makes a big difference. So I think both Clinton and Trump will, you know, Trump's had to go to all these city councils around the world getting permission to put in his buildings. He understands the art of politics at, as a personal level. Hillary Clinton does too. She's been a deal maker. That's, you know, we can talk about some other attributes, but she understands how to succeed because she saw her husband make deals, and we had a period of time with uh, with Newt Gingrich as, as the speaker and with Bill Clinton there that actually big things moved in the Congress. I think what you're saying is that uh, we have a better prospect for yes. uh, White House congressional relations. Um, Senator Daschle, in your book, uh, there are six references to Senator McConnell. Um, and uh, perhaps because you're writing with Trent Lott, you uh, uh, treated him uh, fairly kindly, but at one point uh, you write that uh, uh, with close elections, uh, the Senate's always in play, everybody's singularly concerned about keeping power, and McConnell has shown evidence of that. Uh, that's putting it mildly, I would think. Um, how much blame should Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid uh, get for the sort of gridlock that we find with 422 filibusters. Well, I How much would you assign to each of them? First of all, I, I think it's very hard for me as a, as a formulator to second guess my successors in either case, but I, I will say I, I think the bigger challenge is not the leadership but the followership. We have, we have people that don't want to follow leaders regardless, and that is really one of the biggest problems we're facing is that we just don't have people that are you know, that are, that are willing to be part of a larger, a larger whole. And I think that, that is one of the challenges that leaders are gonna face. They can be very well intended, but if they don't have followers with them, ask John Boehner, that's probably the best yeah. example. Uh, John Boehner really tried in many cases to try to figure out a way to, to do a deal, but he just didn't have the support. And so whether it's Harry Reid or Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, Nancy Pelosi, they're all facing very raucous caucuses. 
Steve, do you think that's uh, in part because the party organizations have uh, become less significant in an age where uh, there's lots of uh, uh, other kinds of money? You know, when I tried to decide if I were going to push back against anything Sen Senator Daschle said, what is a political scientist I'd likely need to push back against, uh, reading past interviews, uh, you know, looking at the book, uh, what concerned me was the, the sort of elite focus, the focus on what politicians do, what Congress does, as the source of, of the problem, whereas the noise of democracy came across uh, somewhat romantically as uh, us all squabbling in the way we're supposed to do to try to try to settle our national affairs. I think these, though what, what's creeping out here in terms of the, the rowdiness of the more recently elected non-leadership legislators who are, who are getting into those two chambers and making it so difficult for both Democrats and Republicans to, to do things, I mean, that's ultimately the voters. You know, and, and if you look at what's going on among American voters, not politicians, um, it's not that they're being victimized by their institutions or a few uh, rules are, are making it harder up at, the, up at the elite level for business to get done. Right now, American uh, voters are more polarized by party than they have been in modern times. Democrat, Democratic voters hate Republicans, think ill of the Republican Party to a degree uh, they, they did not used to and vice versa. Uh, more and more voters are polarized by where they live where the voters in some states hold negative opinions and drastically different preferences from the voters in other states. And then within our communities, we see the same divisions. There are precincts in Lexington that are overwhelmingly Republican. You can walk down from house to house and you probably won't find a Democrat until, you, until you've circled half, half of the precinct. There are other precincts that are entirely Democratic. I, I live in one. I made a statement, there's not a single Trump sign on an entire street in my neighborhood. My daughter said, no, there is one. It, it's hidden behind that truck on the house <laughs> at the corner. Okay. There are very few neighborhoods where you could walk down your street and have both Democrats and Republicans living with you. And we want it that way. We're asked, you know, do you want Republicans in your family? And Democrats said, no. And we're asked, you know, would you, would you like to live in a community where there, where there are people of the opposite party? And we say, no. And so, so you know, Al, I, I think that you know the, the Senator Daschle's uh, and Senator Lott are to to a too extreme degree uh, are suggesting the customers right and who who broke the system were the politicians and the elites. But when we look at what's going on in the surface of American society, uh, especially with the shift toward a focus on cultural politics, social politics, where Republicans and Democrats are more and more divided based on morality, more and more divided based on civil rights. Uh, and, and, and these, these highly polarizing issues, uh, I don't think you get a full story and I don't think you can get a repair uh, if all your fixes are, are focused on politicians. I, Thanks. I, 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 I could just say, I think Steve's exactly right. I, we don't have the kind of citizens engagement that we need and that's one of the things we try to address in the book. You know, the fact that only 38% of the voters voted in 2014, 38%, almost two thirds decided to stay home for some reason. So when you've got a minority of voters making these decisions, and they are as alienated as they are, it just exacerbates the problem even more. Well, Mike, uh, uh, Republicans uh, generally uh, are skeptical of efforts to expand turnout and engagement because high turnout tends to be to your disadvantage. Well, that's a fallacy. If you, Hill, uh, Haley Barber, my good friend from Mississippi, and I have gone back and looked at that, that is not exactly true on statewide elections, Al, if you, if you study that. I'm talking That's, about congressional versus presidential years. Well, yeah, you know, we can get into the, to the details on, on, on that, but it's in our benefit to have more people turn out. We try to persuade people. We want people to turn out. I, I'm for more engagement, too. But I'm also for the idea that it's important to understand that there is a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. And if we had this period after World War II where they'd gone and fought together, they came back, they, you know, we, we have a a view, a romanticized view of what Congress should be like. Uh, frankly, that's in the sweep of history, that's not always been that way. We're, we're more in a normal situation right now where there is a clear distinction, and I think that should get more people involved in politics. I think you're <coughs> certainly seeing it this time with, uh, uh, with the intensity on, on both levels. You saw it with Bernie Sanders, that intensity is there. We are going to offer the opportunity for uh, members of the audience to ask questions. Are, uh, are we passing cards? Are there people to pass cards to the audience? 
if, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll uh, bring you a card and uh, uh, you can write it down and we'll uh, ask it at some point. We uh, do this in part to uh, keep a, a good uh, narrative going where uh, one question sort of leads to the other. Um, Mike, uh, another Republican national chairman and a uh, Republican senator from Kentucky, Fruston Morton, uh, at the time he held both jobs, said that the purpose of politics was to form a government. And now it appears that those in government are focused too much on the, net, on the next election. Uh, I'd like you and the other panelists to address that and uh, explain why that's more true today than it was then, if it is so. Well, as I started out today, I think you have to separate the difference between the campaign and, and the politics. Now, the campaign has become incre increasingly longer and longer, and that's harder to do. But governance is what this is all about. That's why we're in, involved and why we've got to continue to be involved. Uh, I, I think Senator Morton was, was on to something there, but I'm not in, in total uh, agreement, Al, because the debate, the ideas, the founding of this country, there is a distinction between Senator Daschle and our friends. There's a distinction in our view of what government is all about. There, you know, I, I believe in less taxes, lower less government, lower taxes, individual responsibility, strong national defense in a different way than he would. We both believe in the American dream and we believe that we're losing the American dream in this country. It's important to understand the details and the distinctions. It's important for people to understand that. These ideas will resonate. They're important. Elections are important, but ideas are more important. Senator? No, I, I think that's, Mike said it well again. I, 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 I don't think, I think because the elections are now in a state of permanent, uh, permanent uh, play. That, that it's not uncommon to get a fundraising call the very next day after an election, uh, and it starts all over. And the problem you have with that is number one that polarization continues, and so people aren't able to come together. And we, we look at look at the legislative agenda not as how do we govern, but how do we keep the other ones from winning. And I think that's that toxic atmosphere, how do we keep the other guys from winning, prevents us from good governance oftentimes. Mike's exactly right. When we created the Bipartisan Policy Center, we said, you know, I remember Howard Baker saying this uh, to, a, uh, uh, to a group as we were making the announcement that we don't want people to give up their political identity. That's the strength of our system. That political identity and our philosophical approach is really where we start. The real question is can we find on any given issue, some common ground as you attempt to govern, to find some reconciliation of those issues. And somebody has to do that, and that's really what good governance is all about. Steve, is this phenomenon of uh, government being too much about the next election really new? Uh, how much has it increased in recent years? Well, I mean, we've been talking about the permanent campaign for almost a generation in political science. So in, in one sense, no, it's not new. but. Uh, money hasn't stopped increasing, and the amount of time you spend chasing it uh, also also you know has has become oppressive. Uh, certainly, we've seen changes in the extent to which legislators are on the job versus back home, uh, uh, and so in that sense, the permanent campaign uh, I would say has you know become become worse, even though we've seen it coming uh, for a long time. Senator, let's talk about the filibuster a minute. Uh, you said it needs to either be abolished or. Uh, made old style filibuster with the mattresses and so on. Um, some would argue that if the Democrats take control of the Senate uh, in this election, they should just abolish the filibuster uh, because there was a suggestion even this week by John McCain that uh, uh, they might block a, a Hillary Clinton uh, Supreme Court nominee. Uh, why not just do away with it entirely? Is that your preference or not? It is. I, I actually think that the, the filibuster served a purpose and uh, Basically, it served the purpose that, that it, we really had to be certain about something. You know, the House is much more uh, spontaneous. They, uh, they'll take a bill, and it's created what we call majorityism, where majority rules, and there's very little dialogue between the majority and the minority party in the House. In the Senate, there's always been a dialogue, in large part because you need a supermajority to pass anything, and I think that's, that's had value. Um, but in the case of, of a nominee, uh, if we go back to the old ways of doing things, 
We'd stay on that nomination for months if that's what it took until it was resolved. That's, that was how filibusters were handled. We, we wouldn't dual track. We wouldn't put it aside and take something else up like we did with the Garland nomination. We'd actually just stay on the floor and finish it one way or the other. I think that's what we're going to have to do, uh, and I'd prefer to try that, to preserve the institutional aspects of the Senate before we give it up entirely. Either of you gentlemen have a filibuster. I, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about Congress just for a second. I, you're leading to the five-day work week al along with it. That's part of your package. And one of the things that I suggested to you when we were going to China, uh, I think a lot of this has to do with staff. Not only do I want a five-day work week, I want my representatives and senators to read the bills. No offense, Ethan, but I think there are too many staff members on the Senate staff and the House staff, and it keeps you from being engaged and involved. I've seen what happened since Watergate. I, I was around, uh, you know, worked in the Nixon 72 campaign. Much less staff then, much more engagement. People understood what they were reading. Yeah, I, once again, I find myself agreeing completely with my, I, I, you know, we've got about, I think now it's close to 30,000 staff on the Capitol Hill. And um, I think it's probably 10 times what it was uh, in the 1950s. So we have expanded, and that's, that's become a big issue. We have a couple of questions here dealing with uh, the future of the two-party system. Uh, one says, so with recent news of internal party uh, corruption, uh, and I would say it goes beyond corruption, but it just you know, all kinds of division. Do you believe we're due for an overhaul of the party system? And another one asks, due to the rise of the Trump alt-right Republicans and current division among congressional Republicans, do any of you predict a fracturing or realignment of Republicans? And I would add to that the fact that public opinion polls today show a majority, not just a plurality, but a majority in both parties opposing freer trade, which I think uh, uh, all three of you would probably say is not a good idea, uh, just looking at history. So uh, given the fact that we have uh, Trump out here as a potential political player, even if he loses, you know, somebody who might want to help organize an anti-free trade party, uh, what are the prospects uh, for uh, the two-party system? And I'll start with the political scientist on this one. You know, the party, about every generation, the party system goes through a reset. And I would not at all be surprised if soon we saw new wine in those old bottles. Uh, and, and trade may be one of the, the different, differentiating uh, policies or issues uh, that, that might come with the reset. But the, the rules of our system, the winner-take-all basis of, of congressional elections, of uh, electoral votes, uh, really biases the system toward a two-party outcome. And while we'll, we're, you know, it's not uncommon to see periods of chaos, you quickly get a reset toward another two-party system. About the only type of multi-party system uh, rules like ours can support would be if you had a completely regional uh, uh, political appeal, something that could take, you know, like a secessionist movement that you might get in, in some other country systems where they're, they're so regionally located that they could win electoral votes or they could take congressional seats. Nothing we've seen so far suggests that we could, under these rules, support uh, more than two parties for long. Senator? No, I, think, I think the political infrastructure is, is in a transformational uh, experience right now. And I, I don't know how it's all going to play out, but it's going to look different 10 years from now, and it already looks different now. And I'd go back to my assertion earlier that we have two other contexts at play now, open versus closed and inside versus outside. And I think those, those definitional roles are going to continue to draw a new um, character to the way we look at, at the parties involved. You've got labor, a lot of labor, supporting Trump. And you've got Republicans who have announced their support for Clinton. Uh, just one example. So I think there is the real possibility of realignment, the trade could be one of those factors. I would also, and Mike's a thousand times more qualified to address this than I am, but I don't think the Republican, hi the Republican and Democratic hiring, and I can speak more to the Democratic side, I don't think the chairs these days have the clout and the authority that they had in the old days. And I think what's driven that is super PACs and money uh, that it really is, has no bearing to the party anymore. It used to be the parties organizationally and financially gave character and gave really support. When I ran the first time, it was my party that was 
really very helpful. Uh, now parties are hardly involved in the day-to-day -day operation of a campaign. It's the super PACs, and it's the media, and it's all the consultants. And that's slowly eroded uh, the real effort around an organizational entity that we used to call Republican and Democratic hierarchy. Mike, what's the prospect for party realignment if Trump wins or if Trump loses? Well, it's not the realignment that most people think that there's going to be a third party. It's the realignment that I've seen already in my lifetime. I, I watched Nelson Rockefeller be booed on the floor in Miami in 1972. We still had the vestige of the Northeastern Liberal Establishment Party at that time, and we were moving towards the <coughs> Southern Party. So I think you may see uh, some geographic, you may see some demographic changes uh, in the party coming up, but it's not going to be a, a, a change in the third party. Uh, as I was telling you about our little trip to, to China, uh, the, the person, the captain of this ship of, of ours that day was Ross Perot, Jr. <laughs> and think back, I mean, Ross Perot had an opportunity. He had the most votes, the most number of votes uh, in a long period of time. There was no third party that came out of that. We had that fear with Donald Trump until we looked at it really carefully. I've had that conversation with Michael Bloomberg personally about can a third party person win uh, in his situation with electoral college votes and where we are now. The system we have gives us an outcome. We don't always like the noise in the background, but we have elections, they have consequences, we have the ability to change things every two years. Uh, this is a question uh, for all of you, and it uh, comes from uh, at least two people uh, raising questions about uh, Trump's allegation of the election being rigged, uh, is uh, that something that uh, can be scaled back or easily rebuked, or does it pose a long-term threat to the validity of our electoral process? C can I start with that? I, I, I'm concerned about comments like that. Um, Tom and I both have been in foreign countries observing elections. I've been in, in Georgia. I was in Taipei for the first three elections. I know you've, you've done them a lot of those working uh, also with, with the Russians. Uh, we have a system that's not perfect, and when you win by 14 votes, it sometimes takes a while to get there, but we get there. When you win by 300 votes, sometimes it takes a Supreme Court to look at it. It's not a perfect system, and if you go and look at it from the Secretary of State standpoint and the voter registration standpoint, it shows you the imperfections. But by and large, the vast numbers, 99.9999 tenths of the time, we get it right. There's still some corruption in our system. We see it in Kentucky. You read it in the headlines. We have vote buying in Kentucky. We have vote buying in other states. Louisiana has quite a history of, uh, <laughs> of interesting <laughs> politics over the years. <laughs> but the idea that, that the election is, is rigged is not one that I buy. Senator, uh, I would say with an exclamation point, I think it's, of all the things Mr. Trump has iterated, the one that concerns me the most is this, because I think it undermines people's confidence in the institutions of, of our republic in a very profound way. And if that caught on and people didn't accept the results of the election, uh, I'm not sure where that takes us. So I'm very concerned about it. See. But we have, we have far more transparent elections than we've ever had. Are there times you can point to in history where things weren't the way they should have been? Absolutely. But I think they're less likely, not more likely, to occur now because of the transparency around our elections and the fact that they're all local. These are This isn't some sort of top-down kind of organizational effort where it's all directed by some cabal uh, in Washington, New York. This is all local. It's all volunteers. It, it's just amazing when you think about the American sort of measure of patriotism could be measured in part by the extraordinary thousands and thousands of people who come out on election day just to just to help with the election. And as, a, as transparent and as volunteer oriented as it is, I wouldn't trade our system for any in the world. Steve, the people need to have confidence in the system. Well, you know, I'd say from what I'm hearing, and it's not a representative sample from political scientists, but the thing he said that's most set people off was not, not this, but instead the the threat to try to, to jail his opponent. If, uh, <laughs> if that, that, that's the one in political science uh, circles seems to be getting the most attention because uh, we associate that with collapsing democracies, not with uh, American system. In terms of the rig thing, on the other hand, to, you know, when, Trump has a tendency of using words in a, in a loose way, and then when you probe the examples he gives and what he actually says about it, it, 
it often doesn't quite mean what it sounds like. So yes, it involves uh, watching the polls, but there's been a long tradition of people watching the polls. And you know, if you're in a, a contested election in a, in a place that it is likely to be close, there will often be both the Democrat and Republican sitting there watching it. That's not really that radical a thing to, to call for. And, and then you keep probing, and what does he mean by rigged? Well, he, he seems also to mean that a lot of the institutions, the sort of chattering classes in our society are against him. But th this election is more polarized by education than we've seen in a long time, and, and a lot of uh, Republicans that tend to be more educated are moving toward the Democrats, and a, a lot of uh, Democrats who are lower in the educational and the socioeconomic scale, scale are moving to Trump. It's kind of natural that you'd see in the universities and the newspapers and the, and the, the, the professional uh, communities more opposition to his candidacy than we've seen in the past. So, you know, is that rigged? Well, insofar as society is rigged, uh, yeah, you know, uh, maybe. Uh, but, but it's not usually what we mean when we say a, a system's rigged, which is somebody's cheating. Uh, uh, and, and then you, you look and you see sometimes what they seem to be talking about when they're, when they're characterizing the system as rigged is that people are actually following the rules. And, and what made it rigged against Bernie Sanders in the Democratic uh, uh, primary and caucus system was, was the rules were being used properly. And, and, and you had in those rules a superdelegate uh, provision where uh, people with long-term ties to the party would get some of the votes in their convention. And it, and it was rigged in the sense that they used the rules properly, not that they not that they cheated those rules. So uh, to, to me, this is sort of a, the, kind of the kind of talk that we've seen in this election, uh, especially from Trump, which is it's kind of loose, but when you probe it, it it's a lot harder to pin down uh, than it seems in the, in the headlines, or in the, especially the clickbait social media headlines. Yeah, I think his, uh, his uh, allegation is more directed at uh, the news media than it is at election officials, but uh, uh, I think he uh, is trying to uh, create lack of confidence in the result. And uh, to me, that's unhelpful. We've had many good questions uh, from the audience. Uh, here's one from uh, Noah Campbell. Why does the public view bipartisanship as a weakness and favor those like Bernie Sanders who propose the same failed bills for 40 years? You may not subscribe to the latter part of that question, but is bipartisanship viewed as a weakness? Senator? I think there are a lot of people, as I said earlier, want their members of Congress to stand their ground because they see it as a sign of strength, that standing your ground is defending your principles and that uh, compromises capitulation. So I think the more anxious and the more frustrated and the more uh, concerned people are, the more likely it is they're going to demand that there not be compromise, that, that there be a capitulation from the other side. So it's probably a natural instinct, but I think you see some of that today. Although I think if you poll the vast majority of the American people, there's still a desire on the part of the vast majority of, of Americans that, that we have good governance and that we find ways to, to move the, the governing process along in a, in a constructive way. I think that's still the minority, but they're a very vocal, very, very outspoken minority. Steve, another student, Timothy Melton, asks, would better education about politics and economics among the general public help prevent the stigma that we seem to have around compromise. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I'd like to believe in the power of education to make change, not, not just by socializing people or telling them what to think, but giving them the tools uh, with which to, to reason through the hard choices we make. Uh, my sense is that uh, what used to be called free enterprise or you know, e economic education has been on the decline. Uh, my sense is that uh, civic education has been on the decline. In, in Kentucky, you can be a college-educated person and not have taken a course on the American political system. In Kentucky, you can characterize yourself as a college-educated person, and you may have been exposed to very little economics bigger than what goes on in villages, in, uh, uh, which isn't normally the, the focus of, of economic training. Uh, I can't believe it would hurt if uh, more American citizens uh, had, and especially the college-educated age American citizens, had learned how the political system works at a more sophisticated level and learned how economics uh, functions at a more sophisticated level. Mike, here's another question from a student, and I think it's our last one. Uh, while the federal government is in crisis, many local governments enjoy bipartisan participation, collaboration, and approval. Uh, and some of them are uh, on partisan elections, uh, not just nonpartisan. 
What lessons can we take from local governance to improve federal operations? Well, politics is local, and it goes back to some of the things that we were talking about earlier and some of the things in, in Tom's book. Uh, there's accountability with local government. You know each other. Uh, I'm a community banker. When I was in banking on a daily basis, if I went to the grocery store and I'd made a mistake in banking, I was probably going to hear it from that person in the store. I think that's why local governments work so well. People know each other, and there is accountability. Thank you very much. Um, I know at events like this that uh, questions occur to people late. Does anyone have the pain of an unexpressed thought? <laughs> is, there, is there a question that just has to be asked? Well, I think we've had a very good discussion, and I uh, hope you'll join me in congratulating our uh,